Um, I want to get going because we have a very full agenda today. Um, we're um, welcome to our Thursday HIV Center Grand Rounds. It's great to see you all here today. We hope everyone's doing well and staying healthy. Um, as a reminder to everyone, please make sure your microphones are on mute during the presentation so as to avoid any background noise. At any, at any time, you may put your name in the chat function, letting us know you were to ask a question. You can also write your questions in the chat box, and my colleague Stephen Sukumaran will be monitoring this chat box and calling on people in the order in which they appear. If you're on the phone and unable to utilize the chat box, you will be able to unmute yourself during the Q&A period to ask your question. So it really is an honor and a privilege for me to be able to introduce our esteemed colleague and speaker today, Dr. David Ho who will be speaking with us about SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. His approximately 30-minute presentation immediately be followed by a, a dialogue between Dr. Ho and myself about his perception of the similarities and differences he is seeing between the HIV and COVID pandemics, since he is a prominent leader in both fields. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Ho. Ho is the founding scientific director of the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center and the Clyde and Helen Wu Professor of Medicine at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. We're really excited that he is with us at Columbia right now. Um, he received his degrees from California Institute of Technology and Harvard Medical School. I think most of you know Dr. Ho has been at the forefront of AIDS research for over 39 years with over 400 peer-reviewed publications. His innovative studies unraveled the dynamic nature of HIV disease, and this knowledge led him to be one of the big main champions of combination antiviral therapy that resulted in unprecedented control of HIV in patients, transforming an automatic death sentence into a manageable disease with over 25 million people worldwide being currently on combination antiviral therapy. Dr. Ho and his research team are now devoting considerable efforts on vaccine and antibody research in order to halt or slow the spread of HIV epidemic, contributing to our goals of ending the HIV epidemic. And he has also worked on SARS and is now devoting time and effort to develop drugs and antibodies against the new coronavirus. Um, with no exaggeration, Dr. Ho's CV has two filled pages, single space, mind you, listing his numerous honors and awards. I will just highlight a few. First off, Dr. Ho has received 14 honorary doctorates. He was named Time Magazine Man of the Year in 1996. I'm proud to say that I have a personally signed copy of that magazine prominently displayed in my office, which is not where I am now, so I can't show it to you. Um, he was also the recipient of a Presidential Medal from Bill Clinton in 2001. He was inducted into the California Hall of Fame. Dr. Ho was also recognized by the Kingdom of Thailand with the Prince Mahado Award in Medicine and given a Distinguished Alumni Award by Caltech. Dr. Ho is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine as well as the Chinese Academy of Engineering, and I will stop with those whole those highlights, otherwise we will not have time for his presentation. So once again, we are indeed honored to have Dr. Ho with us today for our HIV Center Grand Rounds, sharing his current update on a very timely topic of SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies. Um, and as I said earlier, this will immediately be followed by a dialogue between Dr. Ho and myself discussing similarities and differences between the HIV and COVID pandemics. And then we will still have time to open up the floor for questions from the audience. So, given all of that, welcome, David, and I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, we've known each other for a long time. And, of course, uh, some years ago, the HIV Center uh, at, at Columbia and, and our AIDS Research Center were all part of the same uh, Center for AIDS Research uh, for a number of years. So. Uh, we, we moved our institute to the Columbia Medical Campus uh, in, in January, uh, just in time to uh, address the uh, pandemic. Um, and I'm going to tell you about work that we have done, uh, largely over a 10 week period between March and June. Uh, and, and that's directed toward uh, uh, isolating and characterizing 
uh, monoclonal antibodies that are capable of neutralizing SARS-CoV-2. And obviously, the goal here is to uh, get good antibodies that could serve potentially as uh, therapeutic or neutralizing uh, against this infection. So, uh, let me move on. I'm not going to say much about the pandemic. I think everybody's been living in the pandemic and knows uh, uh, the numbers. Uh, nor am I going to go into uh, the virology extensively, but I think uh, I need to start by showing you an uh, EM picture of the uh, coronavirus uh, with a spike, uh, with these spikes uh, shooting from the uh, virion surface. Uh, and each spike uh, is comprised of uh, three units coming together to form a, a homotrimer. Uh, and, and of course, this spike is what binds to the receptor on the host cell. And as we all know, the receptor for SARS-CoV-2, as well as for SARS, uh, is the, the ACE2 uh, molecule. And this trimer here uh, is responsible for that specific engagement. And in particular, uh, the binding is mediated by one element of the trimer called the receptor binding domain. So this would stick to ACE2, and then the whole uh, particle would enter uh, endosomes, and when the pH is lower in the endosome, fusion occurs, and the virus then enters the cellular uh, cytoplasm. I should mention now that there is another domain ca called the N-terminal domain or NTD, uh, and you'll hear me refer to RBD, NTD, uh, and the whole thing I will call the, the trimer. And obviously, when we want to develop antibodies that could neutralize the virus, the main target is this uh, spike trimer. And so this is what we utilize to, uh, to isolate the antibodies from infected persons. And before we uh, embarked on that effort, we actually uh, characterized, uh, with the help of Michael Ying in the Infectious Disease Division, uh, 40 uh, subjects with SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection confirmed by PCR. And we uh, broke the uh, patients into two categories. One, uh, severe, uh, i.e. those with severe disease uh, requiring hospitalization and mechanical ventilation. And then uh, the non-severe cases, uh, largely outpatients, a few uh, were hospitalized, but they were not on mechanical ventilation. And we looked at their uh, neutralizing antibody responses uh, in the laboratory, in, in their plasma samples. And as you'll note here, for the severe cases against SARS-CoV-2 pseudovirus or the SARS-CoV-2 live virus, uh, we see that uh, these neutralization profiles are pretty much shifted to the left compared to the profiles of those with non-severe disease. And as you move to the left, it simply means that the neutralization titers are higher. And as you could see here in these uh, uh, analyses, uh, the, the ones with severe disease had about one log higher titer uh, in either of the neutralization uh, assays in, in vitro. So we, we realized that uh, patients with severe disease actually had higher uh, neutralizing antibodies. This is very similar to what was noted in, in HIV. Those with viremia generally had by better uh, neutralizing antibodies. And we surmise that is because of uh, more antigen exposure and, uh, for a longer period of time. So hence, we, when we started to, uh, to uh, embark on isolating monoclonal antibodies from these infected uh, patients, we obviously focus on individuals shown here uh, with the highest titers. So these are the neutralization profiles of all the cases that we have studied. And we, we zeroed in on those with the most robust uh, titers. 
And, and it turned out that all these uh, five cases uh, were somewhat elderly. That's not unexpected given that they're all uh, patients with severe disease. Uh, they range from about from 50 to 71 to Hispanic females, uh, two white males and one uh, black male. Uh, all of them had acute respiratory distress syndrome requiring mechanical, uh, most of them require mechanical ventilation. Uh, and um, uh, four recover and were discharged, uh, one died uh, in the hospital. And, and here's a, a scheme that we follow to isolate the monoclonals. Uh, I don't have time to go into it in detail, but from each patient, we obtain blood, isolated the mononuclear cells that is largely comprised of lymphocytes. And then we went through a sorting process that's uh, shown here. But in essence, we concentrated on single live cells that were not T cells, so they're not CD3 cells, but instead focus on B cells of the memory phenotype. This so then being we, we focus on memory B cells that bound the SARS-CoV-2 trimer. And as you could see in these uh, five panels on the right, these are the same panels blown up. Uh, what we noted was uh, there were a number of memory B cells that bound the trimer. Uh, for four of the cases, very few from this patient three. And then what, what could be done in the laboratory is to use uh, new technology to then put each of these B cells in, uh, in droplets and then from the droplets sequence the heavy and light chain gene of the antibody within that B cell in a pair fashion. And so the, we could get the sequences and from the sequences, we could construct the, reconstruct the antibodies and then uh, do the proper screening to see if the antibodies indeed bind the trimer uh, and neutralize the virus. So this is a, pro a very elaborate process uh, that I uh, sim just simplified. But once the antibodies were uh, reconstructed and screened, uh, this is what we found on the screening. Uh, patient one, two, three, four, five, uh, shown in different colors. And on the top, row here, we're looking at binding of the antibodies to the trimer. So in total, we pulled out 252 monoclonal antibodies. And you could see many of them do bind the trimer. Uh, so based on the re reactivity here. And so about half bound the trimer. And then a subset of those that bound the trimer also bound what we call the receptor binding domain, RBD. Interestingly, patient five had no RBD-directed antibodies. And then on the, this row and the bottom row, we're looking at uh, neutralization of the pseudovirus or live virus. And I should have mentioned earlier that pseudovirus is simply viruses that we could construct in the laboratory that are not infectious, but you would use uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spike to enter the cell and therefore the assay in this system typically correlate fairly well with the live virus assay. So this is just a, a, a simple technique we could use in the laboratory. But of course, we verify everything on the uh, infectious virus. And you could see that we also found a bunch that could indeed neutralize the pseudovirus or the live virus. So that's summarized here. I would just go over the top row in total, we pulled out 252 monoclonal antibodies, about half bound the trimer, and of those, about a, a, a third bound the receptor binding domain, and two thirds recognized other regions of the spike. And as you could see, uh, uh, about half of this uh, trimer bound antibodies could neutralize the virus, the pseudovirus, and slightly uh, less could neutralize the live virus. Um, the next slide, we simply uh, look at these 250 
uh, of these 102, 121 antibodies for their gene usage. Uh, they're largely IgGs. We know they're heavy in light chain usage. Uh, there's not much to, uh, to, to talk about except what's down here. And that is compared to normal shown in the cyan color, the orange color denote the somatic hypermutation level uh, of the antibodies uh, found uh, among these 125, 121. And that is, there is very little somatic hypermutation. That is, the antibody genes are made almost close from germline. So it's actually very easy to generate these neutralizing monoclonal antibodies uh, without extensive hypermutation. And this, this, from a technical point of view, uh, bodes very well for vaccine development uh, uh, downstream. But let me uh, come back to tell you how we further characterize the monoclonals. Uh, we, we broke the uh, neutralization profile of these five cases down, uh, case by case, and, and of course, focus in on those color lines that denote the most potent antibodies. Uh, so we picked up 18 antibodies in, in this manner, plus one that was initially missed, but then uh, was picked up in subsequent uh, studies. So in total, we isolated 19 monoclonals uh, that were further, uh, that were characterized in detail. And those 19 are shown here. We show that all uh, 18 of them uh, recognize trimer very well, but one did not uh, bind the trimer in this assay system very well. Um, but of, of those 19, nine of them clearly recognize the receptor binding domain uh, and not the N-terminal domain. Uh, this is just a sticky antibody. Uh, eight of them do not recognize the receptor binding domain, but instead recognize the N-terminal domain at uh, varying levels. Uh, as you'll see later, even though these are low levels, they turn out to be true recognition. But uh, we found two antibodies that uh, uh, do not bind to RBD nor NTD. And uh, as I will tell you later, these actually recognize quaternary epitopes, that is, epitopes that are fo formed by different regions of the molecules coming together. And so it's not possible to map it with a single domain. From these, we next uh, looked at the uh, neutralizing activity in vitro against the pseudovirus on top, against the live virus on the bottom. And then these are stratified according to their epitope uh, uh, cluster. So the RBD-directed antibodies are here, NTD-directed here, and the others uh, shown here. And you, you see, we see a range of neutralization profile that went from essentially five nanogram per ml to, um, to about half a uh, milligram per ml. So there's quite a bit of uh, variation. Uh, and, and when we do the live virus assay, uh, it's pretty much the same, perhaps a slightly wider range. And you could see that we have four antibodies that are neutralizing the virus with uh, what we call IC50 in the nanogram uh, per, M, per ml range. The same for the NTD directed monoclonal antibodies. Uh, we come down here and we see three of them with very, very good uh, potency. And both of these happen to be uh, very potent against the live virus as well, three and seven nanogram IC50. So these are extraordinarily uh, potent uh, antibodies. Um, and we wanted to understand more how they are recognized the SARS-CoV-2 trimer. But before doing that, uh, we wanted to also characterize together with those 19 a number of uh, antibodies 
that bound this, the pro spike trimer uh, well, but do not neutralize the virus. Uh, and you could see down here, these antibodies don't neutralize, and these only neutralize at extremely high concentrations, so they're rather weak. And the, the reason is we want to throw these in uh, in the uh, epitope mapping effort, so we could look at the neutralizing and non-neutralizing antibodies in one experiment. Uh, this is what we call competition ELISA. So it's basically we're uh, seeing how antibodies compete for the binding to the trimer uh, with each other. So this is done in a checkerboard uh, fashion. And when we label these antibodies and then we compete with the same set of antibodies that are unlabeled. And for the left side, we're looking at uh, antibodies that are not directed to RBD. On the right side, we're looking at antibodies that are directed to RBD. And in this checkerboard fashion, we could see clustering and we could uh, denote those clusters and uh, understand the relationship of these monoclonal antibodies to one another. I will not go through this uh, uh, effort uh, other than uh, using the next slide to tell you that from such mapping studies, uh, we came up with a, uh, these Venn diagrams that know how the antibodies uh, map to the NTD region and to the RBD region. And you could see that um, here on, on this side, the potent antibodies are denoted in dark red, the weaker antibodies are in pink, and the non-neutralizing antibodies are in black. And the, and the antibodies that, that could bind the NTD are encircled by the oval uh, here. And you could see we, we indeed have one large cluster and all the potent antibodies are essentially grouped together. The weaker ones are to one side and the non-neutralizing antibodies are uh, uh, outside those uh, regions. <clears throat> On the RBD side, you could see uh, same thing. Those that competed with ACE2 binding, so those that block receptor binding are in circle uh, by this uh, green circle. And, and what you see is once again, there is a surface uh, which is targeted by all the potent antibodies and then uh, surfaces that are targeted by weaker antibodies and then we have non-neutralizing uh, epitopes uh, in addition. So this effort led us to have a pretty good understanding of where the antibodies were uh, directed uh, on the trimer. But of course, uh, there's nothing like getting the actual structure. So we worked together with Larry Shapiro's team here at Columbia and uh, really solved the crystal structure of three of the antibodies bound to uh, the spike trimer. So we, ha we have one RBD, one NTD, and one that was in the other category. So let me uh, basically explain what you're seeing here. So you, you see the, the spike at the here, that's the spike, and the NTD is colored in the orange color, the RBD is in the uh, green color here, and the antigen binding domain of this 2-4 RBD directed antibody is shown in uh, uh, dark blue and cyan, uh, denoting heavy and light chain respectively. And this in essence is directly competing with the receptor. It, it binds to RBD and, and keeps the RBD down if you turn this molecule, rotate this molecule forward toward you 90 degrees, this is the top view, and you can see the antibodies, uh, the antibodies uh, are simply bound to the uh, green portion, the RBD. Uh, and so the neutralization mechanism of such antibody is quite clear from the structure. Uh, next, uh, here we have an antibody structure of uh, an NTD-directed antibody, and you could see it's binding to the uh, orange uh, portion. 
in this side view and the top view, it's, it's clearly binding to one edge of the NTD. And we still don't understand how such an antibody could inactivate the virus. It must uh, affect some post-binding event that's required for virus entry. But the mechanism of virus neutralization remains uh, unclear. This antibody is, is uh, what we refer to as quaternary uh, in nature. It clearly is not recognizing a single domain. Uh, perhaps this view is hard to see, but if you look at the top view here, it is wedging itself between two RBD units. And, and that's why it, it doesn't bind to a single RBD uh, with any good affinity. But it does bind to this trimer in this fashion by inserting itself uh, in this crevice. And so uh, from these structures, as well as the mapping data, we could actually uh, map most of the antibodies onto the, onto the contour uh, of the trimer uh, on the side view and top view. And you, you could see the initializing antibodies basically uh, the potent ones are all, all directed to the top and the weaker ones are directed to the sides of the molecule. And as you come to this top view, uh, this, this patch here, this is RBD, and this is where many of the potent neutralizing antibodies are directed. And NTD here, at the top of the NTD, a lot of the more potent neutralizing antibodies are directed to. And once you go down to the side, uh, you have weaker antibodies. So this gave us a pretty clear understanding of what's going on. So uh, we, our group has not been alone in doing this. As you can see, many groups are coming up with antibodies directed to RBD, NTD, and other regions. Uh, most of the groups today have worked on RBD alone. Uh, we're rather unique in, in working on uh, many different regions of the the spike. Uh, and you could see of our antibodies shown in red, we have some among the most potent directed to RBD. Uh, and then uniquely, we have potent antibodies directed to NTD as well as to quaternary epitopes. And um, many of the antibodies shown here are going into clinic, are already in clinical development or going into clinical development, uh, as will be ours. Let me just show you one final experiment uh, where we put uh, one of the mo more potent antibodies, this one, 215, into uh, hamster experiments. Uh, as you may know, hamsters are susceptible to uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, and do, they do develop lung infection and uh, mild disease. Uh, and you could see in this experiment, this is a prophylaxis experiment where we administer the antibody at, at a relatively low dose, 1.5 milligram per kilogram, or a dose that was chosen to have, uh, as, pre as we had predicted, to have um, minimal effect uh, or control here. And, and we would give the antibody at day minus one, give the virus to these hamsters at day zero, and on day four, the lung tissue the animals were sacrificed and lung tissue harvested, and, and we measure for viral nucleic acid here or, or for infectious virus here. And as you could see, uh, by either assay, we have uh, four or five log reduction uh, in the amount of virus uh, noted for the high dose group. And as we had anticipated, only a marginal effect uh, at the lower dose. Uh, and these uh, results really show you how uh, potent uh, the antibody could be in just dropping the virus, essentially, uh, in this case, to undetectable by in, uh, when we look for infectious viruses. So this cert we certainly believe this type of effect should translate uh, into uh, uh, humans. So we, we believe that uh, such antibodies are going to be uh, useful uh, in treating early infection, probably not in late infection because it's 
the late manifestations are largely due to uh, inflammatory and other uh, cascades that are triggered by viral infection. But in terms of treating early infection to prevent disease progression and death uh, is, uh, is possible. Uh, the potency of these antibodies are much greater than uh, remdesivir, which is the only antiviral approved for SARS-CoV-2 uh, treatment today. And of course, we believe uh, these monoclonals will be much superior to plasma therapy and, and actually be much more practical as well. Um, and of course, they could be uh, used for prevention before a vaccine uh, becomes available. And particularly among elderly and immunocompromised individuals uh, who may not be able to mount a robust response to the vaccine. And of course, uh, although promising results are emerging from early vaccine trials, we don't know the, uh, the durability of such uh, responses. And in fact, the antibody engineering has become quite sophisticated. So we could engineer the FC tail of an antibody to improve half-life so that it only requires uh, administration every six months or so. So we believe that this strategy is promising and we're in the process of um, discussing partnerships that would allow us to get these antibodies into uh, human trials uh, by October. So I will conclude by telling you uh, that the credit uh, for the work that I just shared with you uh, goes to a whole team. We actually develop a pipeline and worked 24-7 uh, uh, nonstop, uh, essentially from March to June. Uh, the clinical samples came from Ma Ying, uh, Li Hong Liu did most of the cell sorting and 10x genomics. Uh, uh, then we have people who did the bio bioinformatics, antibody construction, antibody characterization, antibody neutralization, and the cryo EM studies. And uh, it required meticulous uh, project management and coordination. And I uh, give uh, all the credit to the incredible team that did all this in, in 10 weeks' time. Uh, so let me stop there and uh, take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. That was just really exciting. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's exciting for us, I think, all of us at Columbia in particular, that you and your team are at the forefront of developing um, this, this kind of um, basic science for, for treatments for SARS-CoV-2, just as you did with HIV. Um, I saw that you mentioned Michael Yin in your last slide and just want to acknowledge Michael Yin and Laurie Bauman, the directors of our biobehavioral core of the HIV Center who helped us organize this um, grand rounds today. Um, I imagine there are a few questions about what you just presented, but before we open up the floor to the audience, and we do have plenty of time, I'd like to first ask you a few questions about your experiences across the HIV and, and COVID pandemics. Um, let me start by asking you, what similarities and differences do you see in terms of responses of the scientific communities understanding HIV and SARS-CoV-2 and identifying targets for treatment? Um, yeah, that's, that's a pretty broad question, but I'll, I'll, I'll zero in on a few thoughts. Um, obviously, the similarities uh, include the fact that both are pandemics and, and, and big ones. And there's a lot of fear uh, associated uh, with these pandemics. And, and in many ways, the early days of HIV resemble uh, nowadays with, with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, HIV remained a mystery, mysterious disease for several years before it became clear. Uh, in this case, it's very different. The, the pneumonia was a mystery for a couple of weeks. Uh, the virus was isolated, the virus in, in, in a short period of time and the virus was sequenced uh, in a matter of days and that sequence was posted uh, a few days later and the world uh, knew what was causing it. Um, 
the speed of the response is obviously different. Uh, HIV, it was very slow. Uh, here, the massive mobilization of the scientific community and the public health community is, 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 is truly unprecedented. I think another similarity I might point out is that, you know, tragically, uh, with both pandemics, patients are dying alone. Mm -hmm. I, I with early HIV cases, uh, because of stigma and discrimination, the, 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 the dying patients were shunned by family and friends and, and, and often died in the hospital. Uh, I'm speaking of the very, very early period of, H, of the HIV uh, pandemic. And here, uh, although the reasons are different with SARS-CoV-2, uh, you know, one notable feature is that they are also dying in the hospital alone, uh, isolated for, and, and although friends and family would like to visit, uh, that was not possible. Uh, another similarity you could say in the early 80s, uh, this, the pandemic uh, was, or at that time, the epidemic was, was largely ignored by our leadership. Uh, trivialized uh, in some ways uh, similar to what the current administration is doing with, with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and, and so the initial response when we could best control the spread of the virus uh, was inadequate and, and the opportunity was lost. And uh, uh, that's, that's certainly uh, very tragic. Yeah, thank you for those reflections, David. I mean, it is striking in, in so many ways. I mean, you're talking about the scientific response, but also the patient experience and the response of the broader community and also our, our leaders. Um, it is remarkable, you know, some people feeling a little bit frustrated about like, well, there's still so much we don't know about SARS-CoV-2 and, and long-term effects and this and that, but it's good that you remind us how quickly the, the virus was identified and how quickly we're moving towards treatments and vaccines, you know, hopefully with good outcomes. Whereas, you know, those of us who were around for the early days of the HIV pandemic, it, it was years, it was years before we got to any of these places. So that's, that's a good reminder of that. And of course, your reminder of the patient's experience, which is, is very devastating right now, of course. Um, you mentioned, you know, about the importance of collaborations and other groups working on this. Um, do you see differences between the two pandemics in terms of domestic or international scientific collaborations? I think early on, the, I'm speaking largely on the science side, uh, HIV research was dominated by groups and those groups led the way. And unfortunately, some of those groups uh, fought with one another, <laughs> uh, notably between NIH and, and, and the Pasteur Institute. Um, and, but, but the response to, to SARS-CoV-2, uh, as I said earlier, uh, is massive and non could dom dominate. Uh, and, and so, and, and in fact, what I personally witnessed is the fact that there is, uh, extensive collaboration, uh, and we certainly receive materials without the usual MTA and CDA. Um, uh, and, and we shipped up materials to uh, uh, scientists all over the world uh, without uh, red tape. And so there was a uh, uh, facilitation uh, that went on that was, in my view, un unprecedented. Uh, that never happened in, in that way uh, with HIV. Um, I think in terms of international, I share one perspective, which probably may not relate directly to your question, but China was an insignificant player in HIV. And in fact, even though China was hit by SARS, scientifically speaking, it was a minor player. But with SARS-CoV-2, that is totally different. It mm -hmm. became a major player and it dominated the science for the first few months, as you might expect, because of the uh, the pandemic started there, and 
And this is a reflection of the dramatic improvement in the level of science uh, and, and their capability in, in, in China. And then despite US-China tension over the past uh, year in particular, um, the, the collaboration from the Chinese scientists was uh, uh, notable. I think, as I said, the sequences were determined in a matter of days after getting the virus and it was posted almost immediately. And that really helped many groups uh, outside of China to get going as quickly as possible. And our work uh, certainly Sorry, everyone. It looks like we temporarily lost David, but I'm sure he's just trying to log back in now. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Wasn't sure if it was if it was me alone or if other people were experiencing the same thing. For those of you who weren't on at the early at the very beginning, um, I hope it's not related, but David was having a, there was a um, fire alarm going off in the building where he is. Um, they thought it was a false alarm, but um, I hope it's not related to that. And I'll take this time to remind everyone, if you have a question for the upcoming Q&A session, please enter the question in the chat. Um, so we can get a line started. Thanks. Yes, and I'll just be asking um, one or two more broad questions for his reflections across the pandemics, and um, then we can open it up to everyone. So we'll still have um, we'll have at least a half hour, if not a little bit more, for for general discussion and questions. Looks like David is joining back now. I, I kept talking, uh, <laughs> but I realized there was no one there. <laughs> yeah, that, I'm not sure what what sentence you were in, but when you fell off, but we're glad we're glad that you're back, <laughs> and it was not related to a fire in the building. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? Why don't I why don't I go ahead and and you know if you have any thoughts you thought that you we, we didn't hear you can add that um, to to this discussion, but let me ask you because um, you you mentioned actually earlier um, 
you referred a little bit to the our leadership and and politics, but um, how do you think politics influenced scientific discovery discovery with HIV versus SARS-CoV-2? You know, what was similar, what was different? If there's anything you can expand upon that from your perspective. Um, I. I think <laughs> you know, those of us who do science, we, we, we push our head regardless of the, you know, political uh, point of view and, and whether there's sufficient political will and commitment to want to address this. Uh, like everybody else, we have our views. I think, uh, you, you know, I, I, am, I am saddened by our, uh, lack of seriousness uh, toward this uh, pandemic, uh, of course, starting at the top, but that has influenced surprisingly a large segment of our society so that we don't take this pandemic very seriously. Mm -hmm. Hence, we have the, the worst numbers in, in the world and accounting for a quarter of the cases and a quarter of the death. And, and you know, the, all the developed countries do a lot better than, than, than we do. Um, I, I'm not talking about science. I'm talking about yeah, yeah, yeah. Not science. Um, and, right. and in many ways, we, we certainly with regard to addressing this pandemic, we're, we're like a developing country. And, and that is uh, very sad and, and definitely tragic. Um, and, but scientifically, the, most of us continue to do our work and I see tremendous progress on uh, basic understanding of the virus, on drug development, on vaccine development. Uh, maybe you missed my remarks about how many vaccine candidates are being worked on, you know, 17 in the clinic, 131 in development. That's just remarkable. And that's despite the fact that, that, that there isn't a sufficient political will to want to uh, rectify the situation, but mm -hmm. I think the the medical and scientific communities are moving on regardless. We know we know how bad this is, and, and until there is a scientific solution, I think our lives will not be normal, and that's going to be the case for for this year and perhaps next year, uh, and hopefully uh, science will come through. Uh, to deliver interventions that are truly effective. Yes, yes. No, thank you for that reflection. And, and thank you for adding about the vaccines because we had not heard that. You were offline, I think, earlier when you said that. Um, you know, I'll just add a comment, you know, I mean, you kind of referred to it, just at least thinking about the United States, those of us who were involved in advocacy and activism, you know, we felt like in the early days there was a lot denial or just not speaking and not addressing um, that was under the Reagan administration. And, um, you know, so the activists and advocates, you know, got very involved and worked closely with some of the scientists. Um, and, you know, I think you reflected on a little bit of that lack of seriousness and even some denial. Um, thinking more globally, I'm thinking of, um, you know, at one point, South Africa and other places, there was the AIDS denialism. And that was various places across the globe, and we're seeing a little bit of that now. But, um, but thank you, David, for being one of those scientists that that perseveres and moves forward, you know, regardless of what's swirling around in terms of politics. Um, I'm just going to ask you one more question, um, a little more like personal for you in terms of your personal experiences, um, and then I want to open it up for everyone else. But. But how did your personal experience as an HIV scientist and, and a prominent leadership leader scientist, um, how did that prepare you for confronting SARS-CoV-2? And were there any surprises to you about that? What surprised you, if anything? I mean, I, I'm, I'm amazed that we, we remain unprepared for the next pandemic, right? Uh, HIV already told us we need to be prepared. The various flu uh, pandemics in the past should, should have taught that to us uh, well. SARS came along and taught us, uh, gave us a strong reminder as did MERS, uh, as, as did H1N1 uh, 11, 12 years ago. Uh, we knew it's coming, 
and yet we are essentially unprepared each time. Uh, so I'm, I'm, maybe I should stop being surprised by these things. Mm -hmm. In terms of what I, what I learned uh, from the HIV experience, I think HIV taught us uh, a great deal that is actually helping the scientists and the, and, and the pharmaceutical industry address this so quickly. I mean, HIV vaccine development was such a tough challenge that many, many novel vaccine strategies were developed in that context and now being applied uh, to SARS-CoV-2 with uh, much better results than, than it, they did for HIV. Drug development, I mean, formed the HIV research formed the foundation for that and, and helped HCV drug development is now helping us target the polymerase, the, the protease and other enzymes of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and, and same with the antibodies. The so-called broadly neutralizing antibodies, again, that HIV took overall about 10 years to, to generate. We could apply that knowledge in a matter of weeks now to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so scientifically, uh, there are many, many things from the HIV field that, uh, that were uh, important lessons. But I think the, the most important for the scientists working in the field is that, you know, when you uh, confronted with the challenge of this sort, it, it is also an opportunity. It, you, you, could, you could make an impact. Yeah, you know, how, we, we, we feel it every day how our world has been turned upside down. But now we have the, the unique opportunity to make a contribution that could potentially impact on the entire world. So when you are confronted with both the challenge and an opportunity, you have to seize it and, grant, and, and run with it. And that's what I share with my team to say, you know, this is, this, this is a, a real disaster, but it's also an opportunity where we could do something and do something quickly. And importantly, especially for the younger scientists, it's when you're entering a new field, there's, there are lots of low hanging fruit that you could go buy and, 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 and pick and grab quickly. And so one should not miss out on such opportunity. That's, that's a great perspective. Thank you for, for all of your, your wisdom and your thoughts. And, and it's, you know, I do like when people highlight, you know, the opportunities that, that crises present to us. Um, of course, on the more social and social determinants of health front, I'll just throw in, you know, what a lot of us know, particularly in the HIV center are that, um, you know, with both pandemics, you know, we are seeing the more vulnerable communities and particularly our you know, minority populations, um, especially in this country being affected. And I think lessons learned on the clinical front, on the advocacy front, on the community front um, are also relevant. And I think um, engagement is happening on that front because of experiences from HIV. Um, so, so th thank you, David, for all of this. I, I am going to open it up because I don't want to hog the floor. Um, and before I open it up, I want to say to everyone, David and I did not plan our wardrobe today. I look like <laughs> wearing the same shirt, <laughs> which is Mine's blue though. <laughs> okay, different color. And my, I couldn't <laughs> see the color so much. We got the same checker. Um, so I'm going to actually turn it over to to Stephen to Stephen Sukumar and to monitor the the chat and the, the Q and A. And as we said, you know, put your name there, put your question in there. And if you're just on the phone and you want to talk, you'll have to unmute and speak up. But it looks like most people are actually joined by the internet. Um, okay, thank you, David. What's you, Stephen? Thanks, Bob. And thank you again, David, for a really wonderful presentation um, and very informative. Uh, so we have a few questions to start off from John Santelli. Uh, first, neutralizing antibodies are not effective with HIV. How important are they in other infections? Uh, the front part of that question, they're not effective against HIV? Yes. So, okay. So, uh, first of all, they, in the HIV situation, the antibodies are con con constantly behind a changing virus. And it's that changing virus that generates uh, waves and waves of antibody responses that are stronger and stronger and broader and broader. Uh, so they're not effective 
in controlling HIV simply because they came about too late. Uh, so it's constantly behind. Um, but however, the antibodies, if you administer them prophylactically, they block infection. And we believe if, if administered uh, as therapeutic, uh, they, along with other drugs, so that uh, uh, mutational escape could be avoided, just same rationale as combination therapy, they are effective. So in the HIV area, uh, there are, as, as many of you would know, there are lots of antibody in clinical development, uh, including uh, one from, from my group. Um, developing, uh, being developed for uh, prevention as well as for treatment. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, I, I just told you that we got the best antibody from the sickest patients, and it sounds similar. Uh, but So that's why I said for treatment, I don't think these antibodies will be utilized for the patients who are in the hospital uh, for, and, and been ill for quite some time. They're likely to be used in early infection so that we could halt progression uh, to severe disease, or they could be used prophylactically. And there are now a lot of animal experiments that show uh, such antibodies could be applied that uh, in those ways. Thanks, David. Um, so you've learned so much in a few months of research. Why would it take so long to take your elegant work to human trials? Um, Actually, this is record speed already. Um, you know, the, the product has to be made under good manufacturing practices. In general, that's an 18 month uh, ordeal. Uh, and because of the pandemic and, and relaxation of FDA and, and other agency regulations, we could do so in, in the course of a uh, few months. Uh, and that's extremely fast. So you, you may have heard that antibodies from Lilly and Regeneron are already in the clinic. And when they started that effort only in February or March. Uh, so uh, things could move very quickly because of the urgency of the situation. But the manufacturing process, uh, some of that is, it's, it's, it's already sped up about five to 10 fold, uh, it's harder it's hard to go even faster than that. And John's last question, uh, the ability of science to pivot quickly from other work to SARS-CoV-2 was incredible. What facilitated this rapid response? I think, I think the scientists uh, realize this is big and, um, and everybody's affected essentially. Uh, in this regard, it's different from HIV. HIV is frightening, um, but it largely uh, affected certain high-risk groups. But SARS-CoV-2 is different. So the, the scientific community mobilized in, in ways that, uh, that are unprecedented. And the commitment, uh, I see, is unprecedented. And then the, the technological side, you know, the kind of cell sorting, 10x genomics, the, all those things have all been revolutionized in the past few years so that uh, it allowed us to move so quickly. And the knowledge gained from working on HIV, HCV, a number of viral diseases really formed a very strong foundation for us to, to move this time. Our next question comes from A.R. Williams. Uh, given limitations with current national leadership, who or which agencies will be charged with vaccine dissemination strategies and which populations are key to first inoculate? That is, uh, for example, urban or densely populated areas, healthcare workers, people with type A blood, nursing homes, the infirm, et cetera. Yeah, I wish I know the answer to all, all, all of those questions. I think on the vaccine side, uh, you probably heard the uh, president's uh, announcement about Operation Warp Speed. Uh, and, and, and obviously that's intended to move uh, candidates uh, through the clinical trial 
uh, process and implementation process as quickly as possible. And there's a there's a czar uh, from the pharma industry uh, who's heading up that effort. And and I think it will, vaccine testing and uh, application will be uh, controlled through through that effort. I think centrally. Um, and and they would have to develop the priority for who gets the vaccine first. But to me, I think we need to protect the uh, frontline uh, workers uh, and those who are most uh, susceptible to develop severe disease, i.e. the elderly or those with underlying conditions such as hypertension and diabetes. Um, the the question is with the elderly folks and, and and you know folks with underlying diseases would have a robust immune response and that's why i felt that these antibodies have a pretty important role to play even in prevention thanks david uh we have a question from Lori. i believe this is Lori bauman our director of the biobehavioral core uh laurie asks do you think that the rapid non-competitive collaboration of scientists around the world will persist and change the way science is done in the future? I, whether it will persist or not, I, I'm not sure I, I could predict, but I think people are behaving differently, clearly, uh, over the past few months. Um, and, and for us, you know, the, the manuscript that uh, described the work I, I talked about this morning, uh, as soon as it was uh, done, uh, it was posted online, and next day folks could see them, see the the paper. Um, you know, fortunately for us, that paper is coming out in Nature very soon. Uh, but but we we took a risk that others could follow our same strategy and 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 do the work, and perhaps uh, if our paper had been held up, they could they could chase us down. Uh, but. That's what we did, and that's what I see uh, other folks doing, whether it's a, a paper on public health or, or the clinical features, or, uh, and certainly basic science. A lot of things get put online uh, promptly. And then uh, the scientific community gets to comment and, and use it and criticize it uh, long before the, the uh, peer review uh, takes place at the various journals. Uh, and and that's I think very good. You could say, well, the you know physical science scientists uh, in this world have been doing that for quite some time, uh, which which would be true. But I think the medical community uh, is is doing that uh, drastically different from uh, half a year ago. Um, our next question comes from Bob Remian. Can you say much about other treatments being developed to treat COVID illness and its associated conditions? Yeah, I think, you know, other than directing antibodies or drugs uh, toward the virus, uh, I think there's a lot of other potential targets, but we need to know the, the, the mechanisms uh, much better. We do know that the virus triggers an inflammatory response that's excessive. And that's damaging. And if we could understand that pathway better, we could uh, we could treat the uh, late complications better. We also know that there is, there are many uh, cascades in the body that are triggered. Importantly, the complement cascade as well as the clotting cascade. And exactly how that is mediated, uh, we need to know in order to interrupt. And we, we, you know, we heard about the clotting complications, for example, that's involved in, in you know, causing MIs, strokes, uh, limbs uh, lost. Um, it, but we, we have very little understanding of how that comes about. On the complement side, there, there are some uh, suggestions that certain viral proteins could trigger a few of the key enzymes in the complement cascade. And the complement and um, uh, clotting cascades are evolutionarily linked, and 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 therefore uh, uh, the viral proteins could be triggering uh, both pathways. Um, a question from Robert: 
what is your view on the possibility of airborne transmission of the virus? I, I'm sorry, the last part didn't come through clearly. Sure. What is your view on the possibility of airborne transmission of the virus? <clears throat> I, I think, you know, it's not an area that I have studied directly, but I read and I follow the literature and there's certainly lots of uh, indications that the uh, in a number of circumstances that are well described, uh, there is airborne uh, transmission, not just large droplet transmission. Uh, you know, in certain uh, restaurant scenarios that have been studied you know, very carefully. And if you really think about what's, what has happened in a number of cruise ships, uh, to me, that also suggests there may be a very important airborne element. Thanks, David. Uh, our next question is from Stephanie Zhao. Thank you for sharing your insights on the parallels between COVID and HIV. Do you have any advice for early career researchers and trainees on how to navigate research careers amidst an emerging pandemic, particularly regarding making decisions about how much time to spend on existing lines of research versus new research opportunities in COVID? Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I'm not sure I would tell people to do what we did. We, we dropped everything we were doing with HIV. Um, to do COVID research. Now, it, it's because we felt that we had something to control. Uh, and, and the pandemic uh, was truly going to affect everybody. And so we wanted to, to take that on. And the other was a more practical issue. During the, during the pandemic, uh, research uh, was to be shut down unless you were addressing COVID. And so uh, those forces, uh, push us for uh, the decision we ultimately make is for the time being, uh, the HIV work stopped and we jump on this, uh, this uh, COVID research where opportunities abound uh, for us to make a contribution. And I, I would think that, that even in, on the behavioral side or the public health side, there are many, many uh, similar uh, decisions to be to be, to be made, um, and, but I'm not sure I want to <laughs> give a very specific advice there because I think you have to get down to the details of, of what you're currently doing and what uh, new opportunities there may be. Our next question comes from Mark Page. Can you say if there's a higher risk of COVID-19 risk for people living with HIV? Is there published work showing any higher infection rate of COVID in people living with HIV? Yeah, um, it, it's now being looked at carefully. The initial look, at least from what I remember from, from our medical center here at Columbia is that there was not a huge impact, but now I'm hearing uh, from the global experience when, when the larger database is being looked at that HIV uh, is a, a uh, higher to their, to their fullest and to the best. Um, I missed that, but uh, I was going to say that it is a uh, it, it is a risk factor based on the larger experience. Thanks, David. Uh, JB asks, "What is your I, Stephen? Can uh, can I just jump for a slight elaboration on that, David?" Um, want to make a differentiation because I've heard at least early on people at least like Tony Fauci saying um, if you have well-controlled virus living with HIV that you know there wasn't at least early indication of an elevated risk so what is what's your thoughts about what you're seeing in the global data is it about people not virally controlled or is it maybe something broader than that I think it's it's broader than that it's it's just Overall, all comers compared to all others who do not have HIV. I, I have a phone call with a, a weekly uh, Zoom call with uh, my former trainees uh, who are now scattered uh, throughout the world. And they head up institutions in China, in, in Europe, in Australia. And we've been talking about that issue. And, um, 
collectively, you know, some of them are on the clinical side and collectively they tell me that they've been looking at this and they believe there is a risk associated with HIV infection, but the exact nature of that, I, I can't speak to. Okay, thank you. Okay, so our next uh, question comes from JB. What is your view on why COVID-19 impacts some people without underlying conditions more harshly than others? I wish I know the answer to that question. Um, it's something I've been asking. And uh, obviously, you know, we asked those questions for HIV uh, for a long time. Why some people don't get infected despite multiple exposure and why some people are so-called long-term non-progressors. Um, and obviously we know for HIV, there are certain genetic factors as well as viral factors. Uh, some of those things have been worked out for HIV. Clearly here, there's a genetic component that uh, is quite important, uh, which we don't fully understand. Yes, there's something on chromosome three. There's a locus that involves uh, a lot of the inflammatory molecules uh, and uh, but the precise mutations uh, or polymorphisms have not been worked out. Uh, and this is a, a focus of a very intensive effort uh, going on by many, many uh, geneticists. Um, you know, we, we read in the New York Times about ABO blood group, uh, A with a slight risk and O a slight protection, uh, but that, that is statistically significant, but the the uh, the hazard ratio is is pretty small. Uh, so there there must be other things going on that we don't uh, we haven't found yet. Stephen, um, another question from John Santelli. As a pediatrician, coronaviruses uh, that manifest as a common cold seem to disproportionately afflict small children. COVID-19 disproportionately to affect the elderly. Is it surprising and do we know why? Um, again, uh, I think the observation is correct. You know, uh, for many viruses, uh, children are the ones uh, who are infected in large numbers and help spread uh, and and they many of them become quite quite ill with it that's clearly not what we're seeing except in rare cases of this uh, post post infectious inflammatory syndrome seen in, in children um, we don't know why i could i could tell you that there are speculations out there that looked at, for example, ACE2 levels in cells in the airway and lung of children compared to adults. And the expression of the uh, uh, viral receptor seems to be lower in, in, in kids. Um, and perhaps that's an explanation, but this is certainly not proven to be uh, the explanation at this point. Um, I'm going to jump in because I don't see any other questions. Um, we're seeing a subset of the population um, who are experiencing lingering symptoms and they're being called long haulers. Can you speak on, you know, preliminary notions of why this would be, why they're experiencing such symptoms months after their initial diagnosis? Uh, again, not very much because uh... There's a lot of work going on to understand, but it, you know, I could see just from the SARS experience 17 years ago that a number of patients uh, who developed pneumonia and 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 were had more severe disease, those are prone to develop an element of pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, from the SARS experience, we know that and. There are early indications to suggest that same thing might be going on with SARS-CoV-2. So, so there may be lingering effects on, on respiratory function. Um, 
but there are many, many other things that we actually don't understand. We don't understand why people lose taste and smell. And, and I have friends who still cannot taste or smell very well several months after infection. Uh, why, why does that happen? Why does it linger? Um, and then, you know, we, we obviously, half of the ICU patients had renal failure. What is the basis of that? Um, and so, so there are many things we, we don't understand and, and the thrombotic complications that we discussed earlier, uh, could some of those be, uh, you know, happening at lower levels that affect uh, multiple organs? Um, we simply don't know. Um, so a uh, lot to learn in the coming, coming months. Definitely. Um, Bob asks, related to my question, there are many viruses that we never uh, eliminate the virus from the body, like HIV and herpes virus. What are your thoughts about SARS-CoV-2 potentially being a chronic illness for some, maybe all? Yeah, I, my initial answer is it's not likely to persist. These type of RNA viruses, uh, are, unlike HIV or hepatitis B, they generally don't persist. They don't integrate uh, into, the, into the host chromosome. Uh, so either the virus wins or the host wins. But sometimes you could have a you know, protracted battle for weeks or, or maybe even a, a couple months. Um, I'm not sure that some of the late sequelae that patients are experiencing are all uh, related to virus replication. They may have been uh, triggered by other uh, mechanisms and the virus is long gone. So uh, based on our fundamental understanding of vi viruses, which ones persist, which ones don't, uh, I would say this is not likely to be uh, a persistent virus in the, the same way that uh, HIV is or, or the DNA uh, herpes viruses are. Um, I think we have time for perhaps one or two more questions. So if anyone has any other questions they'd like to ask, please enter in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. If not, I will hand it back over to Bob closing remarks. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, David. Um, David, we really can't thank you enough for, um, for this. Um, one more question. <laughs> uh, is there another question you want to throw in there? Oh, just one quick one. Uh, David, do you think a person can be reinfected with COVID after recovery? Good question. <laughs> um, the, we have, again, very limited data on in monkey experiments, uh, so far, no. Uh, a few uh, small study from China suggests monkeys, once infected, cannot be reinfected. There's a vaccine study that was published in Science where some monkeys got infected and then were re-challenged, and that also did not result in productive infection. Uh, we we certainly hear a lot about uh, cases where people had it went PCR negative and then uh, had symptoms and then had PCR positivity once again. But whether that's true reinfection or, you know, PCR results fluctuating, uh, it's, it's not clear. I would say I have not seen definitive cases of reinfection, even though that's talked about, uh, talked about quite a bit. Thanks, David. And this will be the last one. I'm going to cut it off. Uh, how many people do you think will be infected in the U.S.? See if you could provide an estimate. I think 
I, I don't know if I'm, I'm the right person to give a number. Jeff Shaman and others, uh, Columbia, uh, probably uh, could provide better numbers. But I, I, I think, you know, Tony Fauci's remarks uh, one or two weeks ago that potentially we could hit 100,000 cases per day. We're, we're drifting toward that number. Um, and and I mean, that's, that's shockingly high, right? And, and we already have so many cases. Uh, and, and this is still going up. And we still are talking about opening society um, in places where you have 5,000 cases per day or even 10,000 cases per day. Uh, in Asia, we already know that many countries have returned to normal and they open up at zero cases or single digit per, per day. And, and we refuse to take those lessons uh, and apply it here. Um, and, and, and in fact, we have leadership that's not only not giving good advice, it's giving intentionally bad advice. And that to me is, is criminal. Whether you use the legal definition or not, to me it's criminal. Uh, and, and so this is going to propel U.S. to a very bad state for the next few months. And if we don't pause here and rethink our entire strategy, it cannot be left to, to states and to, you know, particular political belief. It has to be one uh, uniform strategy applied nationally to bring it under control. I mean, we, we have no travel restriction uh, between the states. And while the situation here is pretty good, like uh, comparison in, in New York, um, anybody could drive to New York uh, from, from hot zones. Uh, and, and our control will be made so much harder. So this has to be applied uh, uniformly, in my view, and has to be taken seriously by the entire nation. Thank you, David. And thank you to everyone for participating in the Q&A portion of this presentation. Yeah, and there are a lot of comments in that, um, David, thanking you for all this wisdom and for everything. Um, I'm, I'm actually gonna squeeze in a one question which you can answer very quickly, uh, I think. And I can't, but try to. <laughs> it's a little bit related to a question if you, uh, a couple of questions ago. I mean, in sort of plain language, when people ask us, you know, and our friends and family and people trying to understand, people looking for it, thinking, oh, I hope I have the antibodies, maybe I'll be protected, and then we hear antibodies going away and, and um, you know, I know it's complicated, but what's just, what's the, what's, how should we all be thinking about it currently in terms of the presence of antibodies and what it may or may not mean? Yeah, I, I think formally we don't have the answer to that for SARS-CoV-2, but I could tell you my gut feeling as a virologist who's seen, you know, seen and read about many uh, infections, the antibodies are going to be helpful. You know, antibodies, uh, are the basis of most vaccine protection. Uh, antibodies may fade in, in their levels in the blood, but the memory B cells are there. And when they're reminded by reinfection, they're going to respond very, very rapidly. So surely the antibodies, they may not prevent the infection completely, but they will, like in most vaccines, will protect against disease. So my, my feeling and all the work we're doing with antibodies suggests that's going to be the same. Now, if you don't believe work from HIV, let's believe work done with coronaviruses. And coronaviruses, uh, we already know that one could develop antibody responses that fade, but in general, that response is protective against the next infection. 
there are four common cold coronaviruses that are known to the field. And, and uh, in, in those cases, um, uh, antibodies uh, do uh, <coughs> need some degree of protection. Great. I knew you'd have a response. That was really, really helpful to me and I think to everyone. So again, Dave, thank you so, so much for this, this, you know, for sharing your, your knowledge, your wisdom, and even your gut feelings. I think gut feelings from <laughs> someone like you are worth listening to rather than um, gut feelings from some other people in our country. I won't name names, uh, but, but seriously, thank you so much. This was great. And we're thank you for all the work you've done in HIV. Thank you for all the work you're doing. You and your teams, thank you for your mentoring and, and launching scientists all over the world. I think you really are, you know, a true hero and a leader in the field. And we're, those of us at Columbia are just thrilled that we can consider a, a Columbia colleague. And so we look forward to learning and hearing more. Well, thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Bob. Great, thank you. And everyone be well. And just a reminder that this is our last spring for this summer. Actually, we don't normally have them in July, but because it was David Ho, we have special grand rounds today, but um, no more for July or August. We will be resuming in September, so we hope everyone gets to have a little bit of summertime um, in spite of what's going on out, out, in, out in the world. So, be safe, be well, take care, everyone, and thank you for joining today. Thank Bye. you.